Uh, I don't know, Juicy J. It's marginal price, right? Holders don't have to pull out. Quants and marginal sellers take care of the rest. Godel Zion put a really nice message in chat on how to optimize a weekly put strategy. I want all you guys to subscribe to Godel. That's how you support me. Don't donate to the chat. This is how I can continue to do what I love, which is talk to you guys and build financial software. This is how I can do that for free. Um, so if you are an active trader investor or you just want to support me and chat with the other Godel traders, there are hundreds of professionals in there. They talk stocks all day, all night. Just sign up. First month is free. Maybe we can get some uh, discount codes for these people. What do you say? Vivek never dealt in commercial products. So we did the same thing in research, but I stepped up <laughs> and bought a lot of mismanaged commercial products as well as research products. He almost exclusively, I believe, did research products. It works. Look at the data. Okay, sure. No problem. <laughs> Let's do that. We did that earlier uh, since you're here. And by the way, if you want to come in our Discord, Biotech Investor, Bioinvestor, I don't have a personal problem with anybody. I have an opinion, but that doesn't mean that I think I'm better than you or I think you're stupid or I don't, I'm a, I'm a human being just like you. I respect people. I don't think the drug works. That doesn't mean that anything else. So this is the data, right? This is the data, literally the data that matters. This is the controlled randomized data. This is, in my opinion, some of the worst data I've ever seen in my life. This is the data. No, no, buying calls allows me to short millions of dollars of the stock because the broker caps my upside. It sounds like you're new to investing, which this is not the battle you want. I know how to look at data. I've done this my whole life. But yeah, come to the Discord and teach me how to look at the data. You, you, I don't think you know my, my track record on predicting shorts is insanely good. Uh, if you don't believe me, read this uh, Vital Therapies report I did, similar to the one I'm writing now. Take a look. This is the same thing. There were newcomers to biotech who were upset when I put this out. This was a very long paper I wrote. I did make $22 million on this, roughly. I know my stuff. <laughs> Ask around on Wall Street. I'm going to make, hopefully, make $5 million or so on this one. I have a stop loss. It's over. <laughs> Chegg was just a very cheap stock. You know, obviously we all know the fundamentals are very challenging. They have a quite a lot of uh, problems um, with their business, their business model. They're going to need to evolve quite a bit, but they're still profitable. And they bought this little language business that's probably worth more than the entire market cap, but it's very opaque. It probably needs new management. They probably need to cut headcount even further, but they also have lots of valuable data. So I've considered actually, you know, thinking about buying, um, you know, potentially even buying the whole company, but it's, uh, it's a complicated situation that, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think you're getting confused with those, what those investigations are. When a law firm announces an, a quote unquote investigation, it's not really an investigation. You can announce you're investigating a company. It doesn't mean anything, right? And you could sue a class action lawsuit. It's about $20 to do it. You could file one yourself. It's just, they have an internal investigation. It says investigation into VKTX surrounding securities law. That sounds like a, that's every, almost every single stock has that. It's like gotten absurd because it pays so well to sue these companies. And I said, you know, we should, we should short a little bit of all three because there's also sell ass, but sell ass, I got less convinced that they're even going to report data. This is dragging on forever and ever and ever. At his mini mental state exam from 16 up to 20, and we can watch him play a sax solo. Uh, and there's up. Just that one thing. Why isn't the data good? If the drug works. Just that one, that one thing. If the data, what I'm saying is, why isn't the data good if the drug works? You don't even have to go through any of that stuff. If if the data works, you just show the data. But the data, the data stink. Corrupt FDA. It means you have a 5% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis given the data set. But that given the data set is very important. If the data set is the same as placebo, you have no chance of rejecting the null hypothesis. That's why the bigger the trial goes, the more power you have to see differences. I think we'll see two to five, depending on how bad it is. If they just admit that it's a zero, two, 
One of them comes with jail time, one of them doesn't. No, I don't think it'll stop at 2 to 10 to 15. <laughs> I doubt it. We'll wait. If they say the drug had no effect in the first phase three, it's not going to have an effect in the second one. Why would it? It's the same trial. Herbs. I had 25 on the Chiefs yesterday to make 100. Bro, these bills are a problem. I was, I was like, ah, I'm going to 4X. I'd buy it, Zip, but you could just have to be patient, you know? I think it already was GME-like, like a year ago. Uh, I'm hoping to get three bucks out of check, at least. It is time to fight for shareholders. We have been mistreated at every turn. Just, just thought I'd make a new desktop background so I never forget this moment. Now, Masad came over in the apartment the other night. My girlfriend was scared. They had Uzis. Uh, I said, it's cool. These are my bros. Don't worry. Have a seat. What would you guys like to drink? And they said, nothing. Martin, if this drug doesn't fail, you and your relationship is doomed because you will both be dead. Said, okay, well, that, that, that raises the stakes, I guess. Better do my research. Okay, so you have some null hypothesis and we're trying to reject that null hypothesis. Ah, my mouse. Um, this mouse sensitivity is maybe too high. You have some null hypothesis, H0, and you get data. And here's the data. So I'm going to put semifilam in red. as 8S cog. Where's my mouse even? Okay, there it is. Um, and you have some distribution. And this distribution has a mean and has a sigma. So we can call this like, I don't know, uh, A0, or like arm zero. And it's got a sigma, let's say, I don't know, 8S cog negative one. I'm sorry, a, a mu or mean, and a sigma say seven. And then you've got arm two, um, and here's arm two. This is placebo, and this is A sub one. And let's say the mean here is, I don't know, negative 0.9. And the sigma is probably going to be the same, right? Around the same, it could be seven point. If you have this distribution, the probability that you can reject the null hypothesis is is what you're sort of trying to determine. Um, and so, if the data sets are the same, the probability that you can reject the null hypothesis is very, very, very high or low, depending on how you look at it. Um, it's extreme because these data are so close to each other that there's no way to ever say that you could reject this. Um, the p-value could be 0.99 or something like that, or 0.9, which means like these data sets are basically indistinguishable. What you need is separation. And if they don't separate, then you cannot reject the null hypothesis. Now, yeah, the, the power is the power to detect a meaningful change is very low. So the hope, let's say I'm gonna put the semiflam like hope in green. So the hope is that you do something like this. That you get separation. But the problem with getting separation is your drug has to work. You will not get this by accident. And praying for this to happen by accident is very hard to do as the sample size goes up. This happens all the time in small trials. N equals 30. And that's why we have p-values. So as the separation goes up, we can actually calculate some of the p-values. Let's take a look, actually, of this program. It's uh, on my GitHub, it's just called p-values. And um, let's take a look at it. Probably should not have run code from here, but whatever. Enter the ADAS cog change from baseline for semiflam. Let's put in, let's say, negative one. It doesn't matter what distribution they follow. And we know what the distribution is that they follow. Because it's going to be the same for placebo and, and drug, regardless. All right, so let's say the mean change is uh, one. And standard deviation is, say, 8. The dropout rate is 
we actually know that. 8s cog change for for uh, baseline for placebo. Now let's put in a, a number that's close. Um, uh, ChatGPT did help me. Um, but I've done this kind of work my whole life, so don't don't get don't don't get me started. All right, so let's do standard deviation of eight as well. Do you want to use the same distribution for both groups or randomize the same exact distribution? Well, let's let's randomize. There will be some randomness. Do you want to enforce a maximum ADAS cog delta between the groups? Yes. Enter the maximum delta. I think we're trying to put something pretty small, so let's do 0 0.05. Okay, so here's what happened in our simulation. Uh, ADAS cog of placebo was better than drug, but they were close. And if you look at the data, the, the p-value is 0 0.87, which, uh, let's go, Charles, um, which is really bad. We run five simulations. Uh, the average p-value was 0.67, and the maximum p-value was 0.8 and 0.5. So the distribution of p-values is going to be a function of the effect size. And the effect size is a function of whether the drug works or not. The randomness around the effect size does exist. So that randomness goes to close to zero in a phase three trial. It's been my experience. It's what very hard to make, it's, it's very easy to make one, you know, 20, 50, 100 patient study will be random by necessity. Once you get into a 900 patient study, you know, the effect size comes out and the randomness goes down. So it's, it's very hard for all that randomness to kind of, we shorted MicroStrategy at 522 and covered at 490. It was a little more romantic in my head than reality. <laughs> but we shorted MicroStrategy at 522. And at one point it hit like 450, chat. Don't worry, Andy. It's no rush. We love you. You're our favorite sub at Godel. We want to give you your own, your own color icon on, uh, in the chat room, maybe OG or something like that. Oh, so did you, did you hear it? Maybe you were in the other day before, but, uh, yeah, so we, we made a little money shorting micro strategy. We covered, yeah, we're not gonna, you're locked in Andy. You're locked in at the same valuation. Come on, bro. We're back practically family now. Adding more data points makes it less likely that the test meets the p-value by chance, but in fact, the p-value threshold is not designed or defined to care. Let's, let's, let, you know, let's look at the, something real quick. There's a really great tool, uh, graph pad. And I'll put this in chat for all you guys to take a look at. Okay, so we're gonna do simiflam here, and we're gonna do um, uh, uh, placebo here. Now, what's funny about this is this is deterministic, right? There's no actual randomness in calculating the p-value once you have the test statistics. So let's say the mean was one and the placebo mean was two. So there's actually a 1.8x, 8s cog difference. And it's 450, 450. You have a lot of power with 900 patients. The p-value just misses here, 0.06. Autofilled. Um, if the standard deviation is very low, let's say it's just two, what do you think is going to happen to the p-value? And I know my wifey knows this, but for the rest of the chat, what happens? I'm going to lower the standard deviation from eight to two. What will the p-value do? So again, I want you guys to pay really close attention to this because everybody gets this wrong for some reason in biopharma, including this hedge fund has some math PhDs working on it. And look, math is a big subject. <laughs> you know, statistics is not the only subject in math. Um, so anyway, uh, let's do semifilam, or let's just do this. Mean is one, SD2, or we did SD8, uh, N450, something like this. I can even get rid of the commas. Okay, this is semifilam on the top and placebo on the bottom. And the p-value was 0.06, which is technically a failure. Okay, so what's gonna happen? The p-value will decrease by a lot. Of 
course. And the p-value here is less than 0. 0.0001. Kind of amazing. So let's jot these results down, see if we can get, make heads or tails of this over time. So here, m is 1, sd was 2, n was 450, m was 2, sd was 8, n is 450. Uh, here, autofill, and the p-value was less than 0. 0.001. Okay. And the confidence interval of that difference was 1.26 to 0. 0.74. Now, unfortunately for cassava, the standard deviation is pretty high. Let's use seven. But there's also dropout, and dropout is, is kind of a problem here because you're, you're dealing with about 20 something percent dropout. So you really have 360 patients of power. Now, how do you get a one point separation? Well, that's a Cohen's D value. Cohen was a great medical statistician, and he said that if you look at the effect size over the standard deviation, you have this Cohen's D value. And good medicine is a D value of greater than sort of 0.5 or, point, or even 1. Um, so you want uh, the higher D value. But here the effect size is 1 on a standard deviation of 7. It's really not actually clinically meaningful. Let's see what happens as our sample size drops to reflect the dropout. And remember, this is if cassava has very good luck. If the drug doesn't work, it's just as likely that the placebo is stronger than the drug. What a field. Uh, but how likely is something we'll get to in a second. But with a good randomized study, they should be equal. Um, and that's been my experience in, in this field. All right, so M is 1, standard deviation is 7. We'll lower that down a little bit to please the bulls. Uh, N is 360. M again is 2, SD is 7, and N is 360. What do you think the p-value will be relative to the first test we did that was 0.06? Anybody know? We are getting a little less standard deviation but a lot less sample size, 20% because of the, the dropouts. Now, how you treat dropouts in st statistics and biostatistics is very interesting, but not really for here. Anyone have a guess on the p-value? I would say 0.1, maybe 0.15. What do you guys think? Take a guess. Let's see. 0. 0.0557, interesting. Interesting. So it actually got a little bit better. It's about the same. So that standard deviation matters a lot. Sample size matters too, but even with less sample, that standard deviation is very sensitive. Very sensitive. And notice the confidence interval just barely overlaps. Okay. Let's do something a little closer. Uh, one effect size obviously is going to be tough to come by. In in phase two, they had an effect size of of 0.5 or 0.6. So if they replicate that same effect size, which remember there was p-value for that was 0.45, so it's extremely likely to be due to chance. But let's say they replicate that, will they hit stat sig? No, they won't. The p-value is 0.25 here. So they need at least a point of 8s cog. But in phase two, they didn't get a point of 8s cog. They got a sixth of a point. So unless we have our standard deviation very wrong, it is basically impossible for the trial to work, if you think about it that way. Now, luck can play a role. But luck plays a limited role in, in uh, most of these cases, in my experience. The same, the same discussion was had for Dimabon, which was very illustrative, where Dimabon's phase two had 4.8 SCOG. But in phase three, unfortunately, the, the effect disappeared due to sort of law of large numbers, and the rest was history. It's kind of like flipping a, a coin 20 or 30 times. You, know, you might just get lucky and get a lot of heads, but if you flip it 900 times, you're not going to get lucky. The only way you could get lucky is actually if, thank you, by the way, for that, 
the only way you could get lucky is if the coin is actually biased. If the coin is biased, well, that's the whole point of the study. You win. The drug works. But you can't get a biased coin with 900 flips by accident. Or at least we, we, don't think so. we don't think we can. The odds of it are a lot lower, at least. But there's still some chance, but it's very, very low. In fact, let's, let's kind of look at what that looks like. So let's say that they're very close together. But let's even say that there's less, even less standard deviation. They behave very normally. The p-value here is 0.7885. And this is likely, you can have a weighted coin um, or a weighted dice or whatever. So there are ways for uh, coins and dice to be um, predictable, depending on how you throw them. There's, there's a bunch of stuff. But anyway, that's just abstraction. So in this case, if the, if the separation is small due to randomness, the p-value is very small, 0.788. So you really need a, an effect size. And the more of the effect size you get, the more you're, you're realizing that the drug does work because you're overcoming the standard deviation hurdle and your, your Cohen's d value is starting to approach something that looks like a medicine instead of a placebo. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Um, I don't think that there's a chance that, I think the effect size will be true in 900 patients. Um, hope that clears that up. I'm sure, uh, let's just say millions of dollars.